podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Briggs. And I am your other host, Patrick Briggs. And we are back with another great episode. It's episode 58, and we are with the London's Children's Museum. We're going to talk all about this fantastic museum that we've probably all had great birthday parties at in the past, and it's just getting better and better with moving to their new space in 100 Kellogg's very soon. So we're very excited to have Mira Nordemir and Vanessa Eastmere here with us from the London's Children's Museum. Welcome. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So just before we get started, let's uh, do a nice little introductions. If you guys could let us know a little bit about who you are, what your role is at the Children's Museum and why and how you kind of got started working there. For sure. So my name is Mira. I am the marketing and sales manager here at the London Children's Museum. Um, I've been here for about five years and I guess part of my role is just kind of helping tell the stories of the London Children's Museum to our visitors, to our members, to potential visitors, um, you know, social media, website, traditional media, this kind of thing. Yeah, and I'm Vanessa. I'm the exhibits and collections manager. Um, so my job is to help take care of the collection and accession new items and show them to all of our visitors and displays or out on the floor um, and in lots of different ways, education programs and stuff like that. Um, and I also get to do all of the exhibit updating and buy all the toys and the new staff to go in the exhibits. And I do also get to sit in on the design team for the new children's museum. You did mention, uh, we were talking before the podcast the start of that you've been there for a few years now. Uh, do you mind letting us know each of you like how long you've been there as well? Uh, like and uh, and actually, maybe even as well to that, uh, how long have you been working there? But how long have you known about the the Children's Museum beyond that, maybe? So yeah, I've been here for five years. Um, and I think, you know, probably like many people from, if you're from Southwestern Ontario, you've probably had an experience at the London Children's Museum, uh, either as a child, on a field trip with your friends, family, grandparents, that kind of thing. Um, so I too have had a, you know, remember a lot of it from my childhood. And yeah, it's just great to be back here working as a grown up. Uh, yeah, it really is a special treat. Yeah, and I am coming up on my seventh year there. Um, I did not know about the London Children's Museum. I didn't grow up in London. So we moved back to London. My husband grew up here um, from Waterloo and um, we had young children. So we started visiting the Children's Museum. And um, yeah, I have a background in museum studies. So when a job was available, I applied. Isn't that great to be uh, have a history in museums and be like, oh, there's a museum for my child now. Oh, that's 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 like a fitting thing for me now for both of us. That's really nice. Yeah, totally. And just like the most fun museum that exists. So yeah, we really lucked into it. Um, do you mind letting us know a little bit about the history of the Lenin Children's Museum? Uh, as it is the first children's museum is in Canada, uh, which is a pretty uh, notable thing about it. Yeah, well, the first one, I'm sorry, but let's cut you off fast about, we'll maybe ping pong back and forth here, help fill in some gaps for each other. But yeah, it's the first children's museum in Canada and one of only um, nine to date. Um, so it was founded by Carol Johnston, who was a, um, a Londoner. She, she passed away at age 89 this past June, um, and she was an active member of our board up until her passing. We were really, uh, we were really lucky to have her. But yeah, this uh, museum was founded by Carol. Uh, her and her family traveled to the Boston Children's Museum um, back in the mid early mid 70s. And Carol was a teacher by trade. And I think she was just, you know, the way she told it was just she was blown away with the, the hands on nature of the museums. And she thought it would kind of as a teacher and an educator that, you know, that was so clearly how children are should learn is through play and through like hands-on engaging activities. And she kind of came back from that trip dead set on helping build a children's museum for London. Yeah. Um, okay, so I can pick up the story from here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so she comes back and forms a group of volunteers and they start the London Children's Museum just in city parks. So they started with this Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels Festival, which was in London parks and essentially they set up a shipwreck with all kinds of different um, things that children could find, like reeds that they could then weave and like mud to make pots and stuff. And they ran that all summer. And then again, the following year, they did another festival and parks all over the city. 
um, the Robinson Crusoe Festival, which traveled children all around the world. Um, and from there, they got into actual space. So they started in the city center museum, which is a storefront museum. Um, and then they were able to move into the London Towers. And then in 1982, they moved into our current building at um, the old Riverside Public School. And we've been there since. So technically speaking, you are still there at that current location, right? Yeah. Yes, we are still at 21 Warncliffe Road South. And uh, yeah, until the new Children's Museum at 100 Kellogg is ready to go, we're going to be open for play here, you know, as long as we can. <laughs> Heck yes. So mm -hmm. take advantage, people, while it's still there. Absolutely. Especially if it's right around your corner in your neighborhood, for sure. Speaking a little bit of the open to play, what some of the the best things about the Children's Museum is some of the exhibits. I personally remember the caves. I was talking to my boyfriend earlier today about it, and he was talking about the dinosaurs and the fossils, being able to do all that. Could you let us know kind of what exhibits people can expect when they come out to the Children's Museum currently? Sure. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, as you mentioned, the caves and the dinosaur exhibit is one of the very original exhibits that was there when we first opened at Riverside. Um, we also have a very popular exhibit called Street Where You Live, which is sort of a community street. So you can go grocery shopping, you can visit a vet's office, um, you can go to your home, you can go to be the dentist or have your uh, parent be the dentist. We've got a construction zone there. So it's really an imaginary little town and um, all about the things that happen in our community. Um, we also have an exhibit called Child Long Ago, which is focused on sort of the Victorian era um, and what childhood was like then. So we have a period um, schoolhouse, so you can be the teacher, you can be the student, you can practice writing on a chalkboard, which lots of kids don't get to do these days. Um, we also have a period era kitchen, so that looks quite a bit different with an old wood stove and old dishes and different types of food. Um, upstairs, we have a science gallery, which is all about science in your backyard. So there's a big tree house with a slide and a little cubby underneath with worms and uh, not real worms, but <laughs> that you can peek through um, and little dens. Uh, we have an indoor garden in that space. So we're growing food. Um, we have a farm to market to kitchen exhibit in the science uh, gallery um, where you can explore how food grows, um, what do plants need to be healthy, and then how do they end up at your table. Um, we also have an Arctic discovery gallery all about life in the Arctic, um, and we have a space gallery so you can uh, work in mission control, you can blast off into space, you can explore the space station, and even do a moonwalk. So. I'll say my favorite, uh, you saved the best for last, in my opinion. I mean, everybody has their favorite, but I love the space gallery. I feel like it, for me, it's like the most immersive feeling. There's a little mini planetarium in there where we do star shows. And I really think kind of regardless of age, the the the, the sort of magic immersive, uh, immersive experience of being in a star lab, I just, I just love it. Yeah, that one sounds super cool. And what about you, Vanessa? Do you have a favorite? Yeah, my favorite is Street Where You Live because everybody loves it so much and it's always where the action is. So that's always where I really like to be. Yeah, I think that like the sort of goal with all those exhibits is to just provide as many opportunities for different types of play as possible. So like Vanessa mentioned, Street Where You Live, it's a like a really imaginative play space. There's also like lots of opportunities for physical play um, and that sort of thing. And the I guess the goal is is just to provide learning opportunities for children of different ages, of different interests. So kind of no matter where you're coming from or what you're bringing into the space, there's like a play-based learning opportunity there for you. Yeah, that kind of leads to my next question of how these exhibits are chosen to be created and like how are they designed to help with the children's play and getting that immersive feeling? Yeah, so as Mira mentioned, there's lots of different ways to play. So we kind of look at it like there's a play spectrum all the way from really open ended, imaginative child led play to playful learning, which is maybe more um, uh, led by adults. So like you see a lot of playful learning when children come to the museum for an education program. So it's much more guided. 
Um, so we like to see lots of imaginative play um, when we watch kids use their imagination to pretend that they're a dentist or a veterinarian or a teacher. They get to learn all and practice all these really great skills around new vocabulary, building new relationships. How do you be in the world and how do you say things differently? How do you interact with people around you by pretending to be somebody else? Um, and then, for example, in the dinosaur gallery, we get children with really, really intense interests in things like dinosaurs and fossils and geology. And those children really get to practice and learn all of their facts about dinosaurs and the names of dinosaurs and where they lived and all the different information that they want to gain. And then also share um, one of the coolest things when we do um, fossil shows or we get to show some of our artifacts to children especially around things like dinosaurs or meteorites and all that kind of stuff. So often they're telling us things about it as much as we're telling them. So it's this really like shared interaction that you get to have with these real experts in their field of whatever it may be. Yeah, I think the dinosaur gallery is a really good example of a space that has like just the the spectrum of learning of opportunities because the dig pit, the digging for fossils is something that you know we often see uh, like earlier children and gave like zero to five, the sensory play, the sensory experience of just being in a dig pit. But then also, yes, the, the older age bracket where it is the intense interests and like children can be experts in, in what they know and share that expertise. It's a, like a really cool confidence uh, and like self-esteem building kind of activity. For sure. These kind of like um, roll into your programs that you run uh, at the Children's Museum, correct? So that uh, you guys run lots of different programs um, that kind of theme around each of these rooms, correct? Um, uh, can you talk about some of those? Yeah, we do. So we have um, we have some regular regularly scheduled weekly programs like our early years play date. So every Tuesday morning we open a little early um, and have some uh, kind of additional sensory experiences for children zero to five and their caregivers. Um, that one's pretty popular. We've been running that one for years. Um, we also have weekly STEAM programs. So that would be the science, technology, engineering, art, and math. And we kind of have yeah, different themes each week. I think this week was a giant catapults because who, Whoa. I mean, who doesn't love giant catapults? The weather's beautiful, might as well get outside and kind of experiment in that way. Um, yeah, so weekly steam, weekly early years play dates. Uh, we also have uh, more targeted events. We just had Bubble Bonanza recently. We have Dino Day coming up. Um, we try to structure programs in a similar way that we would structure exhibits just with the different learning opportunities available, different ways for children of different ages and interests to engage. Um, yeah. It sounds really awesome. I kind of, mm -hmm. is there, is there stuff for the adults? I just wondering, there's stuff for the adults, right? Always, always. You're never too old to play. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and along with some of these programs, I've noticed uh, that you kind of offer different types of nights. So you have like the family free night, the low sensory nights. How did these kind of get started and why do you think it's important to include these nights in uh, with the Children's Museum? Yeah, the Free Family Fun Night, we've um, been running for a number of years, but it's really sort of come out of um, the idea that understanding that children, that all children deserve access to hands-on learning, kind of regardless of their circumstances. And it's, yeah, the our subsidy programs, they have various avenues, whether we have subsidized field trips, subsidized memberships, and also subsidized admission, like our free family fund night. And it's just really founded on the belief that like all children deserve hands-on learning and the financial barriers shouldn't prevent children and families from accessing that. Um, so really all families are welcome. It's every or every Thursday from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Um, it's a really, honestly, it's a lot of fun. We, we always run a STEAM program that night. So there'll be um, some version of science, technology, engineering, art, and math, hands-on programming happening those nights. Um, the low sensory night, that one's a bit newer for us. We've only been running that um, this past year. It kind of came out of uh, some feedback we were receiving from the community and some partnerships with different organizations that we were working with, uh, like Autism Ontario and TBCC, and a lot of these community organizations that, yeah, we just kind of worked with them to consult on how we can pro better provide uh, an experience for families whose children may have sensory processing difficulties or other exceptionalities. How can we provide an experience that um, better meets their needs and wants? 
And yeah, so that one's new for us and it's been going really well. It's been, we've got great feedback for it and it's every third Tuesday of the month. I have a couple coworkers I need to let know about this. This is fantastic. They have kids awesome. that would love it. Yes. Oh, I want to add the admission on low sensory night is also free as well. So yeah, it's really the goal just to reduce as many barriers as possible. This reminds me of, um, all of this is just reminding me of being a kid uh, while I was there, you know, uh, we were talking about the rooms earlier. Uh, and I, I didn't get to jump in and say my favorite room uh, was the, uh, it was definitely the caves, I think. That's the thing that sticks into my head the most was just like, I was one of those kids that liked to crawl around places and find weird entrances and I don't know, this and that. And the caves was one of those places where imagination could just roam free. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in there. Imagine. I love the caves. Yes, yeah. it is. It, it also has the like, a really immersive quality to it um and yeah and adults i think adults still love the caves because we often see them trying to crawl through the little <laughs> child-sized tunnels in there <laughs> and the caves are cool because they are a little bit scary so we have mm -hmm. lots of little yeah. ones who are really reticent to go in the caves but then we have lots of visitors who come back again and again and they might you know take a step further into the cave each time they come so when they're feeling comfortable enough to make it through the caves it's quite a success story for them because it's mm. a fear they've conquered and now they're brave and they're big enough to go through them so i think it creates quite a memory because it's a little bit emotional for them right mm. that's very cool i like that that's a great takeaway <laughs> amazing well uh speaking of kind of the uh takeaways you have kind of brought some take uh, takeaways of your own uh in, in its own way you know but it's it's in its own preserving way because it is a museum um there are likely some like cool artifacts you might say uh that the families can check out when they're there um what are some of the things that people can look forward to um you know i believe you might have even brought uh, some examples for us we do have a few here i'll let vanessa sort of explain the artifacts and um sort of our the kind of framework from which we collect artifacts, but I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek right here. So this one's our meteor, right? Um, wow. Yes, and this is, I think, part of our goal with artifacts is to just provide children with this sort of authentic hands-on experiences. And part of that authenticity is having real items. You know, so this is a real artifact. It was really from outer space. And that kind of fact alone is mind-blowing enough for kids, um, but also, yeah, this one's really interesting in that the tactile experience of it, as you can see, it's really, really textured. Mm -hmm. um, it's also magnetic, as you can see this magnet sitting here, and it's also extremely heavy. So it's, yeah, it provides a real um, kind of impactful sensory experience for, for our visitors. Yeah, it's always like a surprise when you hand it to somebody, even adults are like, whoa, because it's so much smaller than it, heavier than yeah. it looks like it should be. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, so, so cool. We have a collection of about 7,000 artifacts. And so we sort of collect under a policy that says we will collect things that reflect children's lived experiences. So we are trying to understand what the lives of children have been like over the years and sort of share that back and forth with people. Um, we also collect things that are of natural interest to children. So things like the meteorite and a lot of our natural history specimens are just cool and awesome to share. Um, so that's kind of what we're thinking about when we collect things and then we share them in a few different ways. So some of our artifacts are not great for handling, so they might be really fragile or maybe not necessarily safe to hold. So we do have exhibit cases that we'll use. Um, we will also just take them out onto the floor and let people hold and touch and interact with them. Um, we also do sometimes some programming. So we had We've got, we run day camps at the Children's Museum. So earlier this year, we had a museum master's day camp. Um, and each group of children got to select a group of artifacts and we built exhibit cases together. Um, they spent some time researching the different exhibits. So one group did um, stuffed animals from the Arctic. So they learned all about Arctic animals and wrote their own labels and arranged them in a case. And then Another group chose Cabbage Patch Dolls, which is really cool. I love that one because there's always this really great parent-child interaction when parents come upon a case of Cabbage Patch Dolls from the 1980s and they have this really great conversation about shared toy experiences. Um, so yeah, that is um, some of the ways we use our artifacts out on the floor. 
Mira, I think you have another one that we pull I out. I do. Maybe. This one's a little, a little more fragile, but maybe does anyone have a guess as to what this is? I guess I'll describe it. So I have a scale like uh, that's a leading description. I have a <laughs> scale like um, um item here with lots of fun little hairs coming off of it. Do either of you have a guess as to what this might be? Uh, is it I I uh, is it from a whale? It is from a whale. This is yes. Yeah, so this is whale baleen. Vanessa, I mean, you can describe how whales use this. Yeah. So baleen whales are like the biggest whales, right? The biggest creatures on earth, and they eat some of the smallest creatures on earth. So think of like the blue whale, the humpback whale. They eat krill, which are just so little, and they do so by using their baleen as a filter. So essentially their plates with little hairs on them so they can swim up to a school of krill, take them all in their mouth with the water and then push the water out through those little hair, hairs, but maintain the krill in their mouth. It's kind of how we often include like some images with this yeah. when we're showing it to children because it's, it's sort of hard to get a, a sense of the scope of really how massive these are and how many of them there are. Yeah, so um, the picture so, yeah. shows a humpback will and all of the little lines on its mouth there must be hundreds of them each one of those is a plate of baleen oh wow it just reminds me of that scene in finding nemo they yeah, just so. thing showing <laughs> water out yeah yeah that's what we talk about <laughs> um and the other really cool thing about artifacts like that both the meteorite and the whale baleen is they pair really nicely with hands-on activities so when we have the meteorite, we can pair it with um, a crater kit, which essentially lets children experiment with dropping marbles or golf balls into piles of sand. And you can see how craters are formed. Um, and if you look at pictures of the moon, you can see like what craters look like. So they really get a good idea of what happens when a meteor falls to earth and becomes a meteorite and causes this big crater. Um, and then with the whale bailing, we can pair it with filter feeding activities where you can filter um, little specks of things in water. And um, you can talk about what it means when the water is polluted and how you can't filter out pieces of plastic from krill um, and help build that stewardship of our environment with kids through artifacts. Awesome. I think that some, uh, I think the most interesting takeaway from this is that me as a kid growing up to this point, maybe never even realized that th it was a real museum. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, uh, I, it just kind of, it's throwing me for a loop right now. I, as a kid, I just kind of, I, I always remembered it as this fun escape and kind of like uh, exciting play area, you know, where yes, you'd absolutely learn stuff, but it was just, uh, and uh, it was kind of more like um, a vis, uh, I don't know how to say it, but like, uh, it just was kind of like uh, intoxicating for the mind to be there, you know? And, uh, but yeah, uh, it's, it's really it's really fun to learn later that it's like actually a full running museum and everything and there's real but, artifact i think we're coming from the perspective that like what you're describing like play is learning so you know even mm. if what you remember is like a, a sort of like active like maybe an active physical play if you remember just like running around unleashed in here that that too is also learning um and so like you know learning looks different for every child but um children really do learn best when they're playing and however they play best and some children may be running around some may be like deeply engaged with something small and intricate and yeah it's going to look different for everyone but it's all learning it's all learning and i feel like i follow you guys on instagram and i learn more with your artifacts you post lots of like oh can anyone guess what this is and seeing what the fun guesses are and then you have no idea so i would suggest if anyone wants to learn more as an adult too just follow the instagram i'm still learning stuff every time i look at it thanks for plugging our instagram i think that's that's great that was <laughs> that was about yeah i think that part of the goal of that is to bring some of the like intergenerational conversations that we hear here in the children's museum into like into people's homes so thinking about like how we can yeah, how we can kind of spread that goal because like like Vanessa is saying the cabbage patch dolls like that's a real conversation point for caregivers and their children and also are a lot of our artifacts we have you know um in the child long ago gallery we have old toasters and old skates that you would that are just like blades you would tie onto your shoe and things that you know some children 
would never ever recognize, but uh, like we hear those conversations happen over and over again with grandparents and caregivers, especially, yeah, especially older caregivers. They're really educational, interesting, shared experiences. Do you feel like you're constantly learning while you're there? Absolutely. Oh, definitely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Every day. When I learned about like bioluminescent minerals and we were playing with them under black lights, I was like, I can't believe this is my job. I learn just new stuff every day. It looks so cool. <laughs> Bioluminescent. That is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Getting the opportunity to hold this stuff too in your hands mm -hmm. as you're working with it as well. Very cool. So there were some, some exciting news that was uh, mentioned a little bit earlier, but you are <clears throat> currently working on moving to your future home at 100 Kellogg's Lane. Uh, could you let us know kind of how and why this decision was made to move? Yeah, definitely. I think um, we've been in our current space for over 40 years and, uh, you know, it's seen a lot of play and we're sort of, um, I think we've kind of reached the like limitations of what this building can offer us in terms of parking, in terms of being able to bring in large scale traveling exhibits. Um, there's some real accessibility limitations in this building that the building's over 100 years old. So there are some things that, you know, we've just kind of outgrown the space. And I think our visitors and our members are really ready for a new, refreshed, um, innovative, and like even more interactive, even more engaging children's museum. Um, so yes, we are thrilled to say we are moving to the fourth floor of 100 Kellogg Lane. Um, we'll have eight all new exhibits. We're gonna bring um, a lot of our artifacts with us. So um, Belina, she's our big whale skeleton. If you've ever been in here, you'll see her hanging in the main atrium. Belina will be coming with us. Um, yeah, a lot of the artifacts are coming with us, um, but eight brand new exhibits that were all kind of co-designed by and for children. So when we started this process of moving to the new children's museum, um, the goal was really, yeah, to create a museum by children for children. So the eight new exhibits kind of came about with the feedback from over 500 kids and families. We did years of community consultations with different community organizations, our, our members, our visitors of all ages. And um, yeah, we're proud to, we're proud to have these eight new exhibits. Can't wait for people to see them. In, in a space that, yeah, like I said, is more, it's more accessible. Um, it's more open concept. So it's all on one floor and like our current space, which is three floors and it can be hard to navigate with strollers and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, just open concept, big space, all new exhibits. We are thrilled. Can you give us a little hint of what the new eight exhibits are going to be? We sure can. So we have, um, Vanessa, do you want to start or do you want me to start? It's a big mouthful, so we'll just. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I should just say before we launch into it, we worked really hard to make it based in London. So it, we want to make it feel like it flows naturally and feels like it belongs here and is about here. Um, so you enter into the first exhibit you'll come across is called Branching Out, which is a forest in the forest city. Um, there's a series of um, interconnected tree houses that are connected with rope bridges. Um, there are various levels. I think there's three levels of heights. There's slides. There's opportunities to communicate with people down below and above and trade things back and forth. Um, <clears throat> sorry, Branching Out also has a fort forest. So there's a space where children can create their own tree forts um, and build on top of what each other have done. Um, and then as you move out of the forest, you moved into community roots, which is similar to street where you live in that it is all about our, our community. So again, imaginative play about a street where you live, but it is now community roots. So it's bigger. We've got standalone buildings that include a school. We have a home, which um, will be a community curated home. Um, so we'll be working with community partners and different families and organizations in London to curate the home on a rotating basis. So um, you might see things in the bookshelves and the coffee tables and the food in the kitchen that will change to kind of reflect what somebody's home maybe looks like, what's important to different Londoners so that people start seeing themselves reflected in the space. Um, Community Roots also has Rescue HQ, which is a um, combination police paramedic fire station. There is a restaurant and a market. 
um, and a little flower stand. And I think a wellness center as well. There is a wellness center, yeah. yeah. And then when you move out, move through community routes, you move into the farm works exhibit, which Londoners are always very familiar with. We're surrounded by farm fields, um, but we've been talking to so many people in the local agricultural community. And there's so much that we don't know about agriculture and where our food comes and what the farms around us are making and doing. So um, we've been really lucky to get to talk to a lot of local farmers about what they're doing. Um, and so the farm works essentially is a farmer's field where you can harvest corn um, and send it on a conveyor belt up to a factory where it gets processed and washed and turned into um, a packaged product that can then come back down and go over to the market. Um, okay, cool. Vera, do you want to take great. over that? Yeah. For sure, yes. Also, I want to say also in FarmWorks is um, the integration of a, a learning garden. So a real, so there's like the combination of, you know, play toys, but also real living, real living gardens that we can care yeah. for, which I just love. Um, and sort of next to that, we have um, the classic a dinosaur area called unearthed so there's a bigger and better dig pit um like i don't know something like six times the size of our current <laughs> dig pit um and that kind of travels through also some caves that go along the back um yes you can't you can't get rid of the caves people love the caves <laughs> also bigger and better caves uh, and the caves kind of come out around the back of what will be um the stream exhibit so stream being a play on science technology engineering art math but uh but water-based so it is a stream so it's a large flowing water table um that's designed to give vis like allow visitors to you know have that sensory experience with water but also experiment with how cities and how cities and different like human practices affect um water quality and water pollution and how we can all be better uh, stewards of our water and the animals and creatures that live in it. Um, there's lots of fun hand dryers back there. Um, and then kind of up top, I'm like gesturing like this is <laughs> up top above all that, above the dino area is space. So uh, you know, it makes sense that it's situated up there. Um, so it will be I think, similar to our current space, but bigger and better mission control, a rocket launch station, lots of interactive things, and uh, also a larger planetarium where visitors can take in star shows and kind of interact with the star field. Did I miss anything, Vanessa? Yeah, we missed a really fun one. We also <gasps> have one called the Discovery Lab. Yes. Um, so the Discovery Lab is sort of a giant maker space for lack of better terms so it's a great big space we'll have a section for woodworking so real tour tools power tools wood different things that you can make in there um, there'll be a section called hack it where you can take apart electronics and put things back together and experiment with how um, things work um, the other section of the discovery lab is sort of this area where you it's paint and glue and all things paper mache messy sinks all that kind of stuff so it's a space where you can really create you can build something you can paint it you can add electronics to it um, and it actually shares space with um, a workshop where um, our team will be helping to build things improve exhibits any repairs that can be done will be done there um, and they can be done in concert with whatever's happening in the discovery lab. So, yeah. Yeah. And at the very back of all of this is um, space, like a big open space um, for events, for traveling exhibits, um, to just keep things new and fresh. Um, some of our like overall goals, I think with some of the exhibit design was um, to create a lot of community curated spaces. Um, we've done a lot of work with uh, local artists, local organizations to fill some of these spaces. So um, Susan Day, a terrific tile artist, ceramic artist from London, um, she's over the last couple of years, she's been working with our visitors to, to make some tiles that will go into a future tile mosaic that will uh, be featured in this new space. Um, we've recently acquired a beautiful piece of art from Jason McLean as well, which will be in our, it's a car, uh, which will be in our community roots space. And yeah, there's lots of, there's lots more opportunities uh, for just, yeah, to feature local artists, local organizations, and really highlight everything that's great about London. 
That's a big list. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's I, a mouthful. Yeah. We're like, sit down. How much time do you have? <laughs> oh, I love this. This is so exciting because, like, uh, like we've been saying, you know, and like you've actually mentioned mostly, uh, Mira, is that like it, we've we've all been looking for an update for uh, mm -hmm. this uh, building, you know, uh, I have this core memory of, of like my childhood there, but this is an opportunity for all kinds of you to uh, make like great educational opportunities and memories for themselves here in this new incredible building. And it sounds like there's a really great plan involved uh, in how it's coming together. So this is really exciting. We honestly came and take credit for the plan because it really is like the collaborative effort of like, literally hundreds and hundreds of children and families and everybody and community organizations and really everyone who took time to kind of co-create this whole space with us. It's really like, I feel very humbled to be part of the process. It's really beautiful. I didn't realize that you would have strong feelings about what needed to be included. So that's mm -hmm. why we still have the community roots exhibit and the dinosaurs and the space. So we are really, really clearly that it needs to be the same but different and better yeah that this spirit of yeah the the goal would be to like the spirit of the children's museum would remain the same but that uh yeah just bigger better refreshed more immersive more engaging um and yeah that we would just help us to better meet the needs of like all children and families i like this like the like the godfather too the empire strikes back of um <laughs> of the museum here the 2.0 i love it Mm -hmm. um what are you both most looking forward to uh, about this space oh my goodness that's a great question i um nearly everything for one <laughs> but um uh gosh i am really looking forward to the branching out exhibit the, which is the first one vanessa mentioned the the network of tree like just tree houses and that sort of thing because i it's um yeah, I just think it's so I've said this word a million times, but it's because it's great. It's so immersive when you just looking at the renderings and looking at um, some of the architectural plans. When you when you look at it, I really feel like I'm in that space and I can see how it that's a kind of space that provides opportunities for like the physical play and the running and jumping and climbing, but also for the quiet moments of like sitting in a tree and looking for animal habitats and reading a book in a little tree nook and I can just really yeah see how special that space is going to be for so many for so many families i am most excited so we have been working really hard to make it a space where visitors can leave their mark um spaces that will evolve over time as people you know build a new fort or create something that they want to display in the discovery lab so i can't wait to see i know when we move in it's going to feel like this great big empty maybe blank space and I can't wait to see what happens over time as all of our visitors start leaving their marks on the space and kind of transforming it into their own space their own community London center <laughs> that was a weird way to say it <laughs> well it just feels like this is a really big community uh project it's not uh like you said hundreds of kids are involved in this uh in this plan which is really uh i think says it all right there right like um you're I, it's not a customer base it's a like but it is your base like you are you are absolutely tapping into your base and you're going kids who come here what do you want to see in the new version of us you know and like parents what would you want to see like for your kids as well and it's I don't know. I, I'm very excited. Um, speaking of me being very excited, when will you be opening up at uh, 100 Kellogg's? Yeah, so I mean, unsurprisingly, COVID um, did cause some delays like it did for nearly everyone everywhere. Um, but uh, construction's set to resume in early fall. So it'll be 18, if all goes well, uh, best case scenario, 18 months um, from about September. Um, it's hard to say, you know, if, I mean, if we learned anything in the last couple of years, it's hard to say what the future holds in terms of timeline and challenges, but, uh, with that also opportunities. So probably somewhere in the, in the realm of 18 to 24 months. I love it. Yeah. I think we were also, um, I mean, although COVID has certainly, uh, caused innumerable challenges for nearly everyone, we were fortunate in that we were able to finish up the design and architectural planning. 
um, during during that time period. So it uh, really is like the construction portion of it got delayed, but we really were able to work on so much of it during the during that pause, including uh, the fundraising. So we are also a registered charity, and we were it's a big project, and yeah, we were able to continue fundraising for it during during that time, and uh, yeah, it's well on its way. I have uh, a quick question about like potential uh, events that could happen because um, I am a musician who performed actually luckily uh, at the uh, Children's Museum a few years ago as part of the Gricklegrass Music Festival. Yeah, I'm sure. Were you, did you ever attend uh, the oh, that festival? Definitely, yes. <laughs> Like that's uh, one of the coolest music festivals you could attend just because of the building that it was in, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, going to see Shad, you know, underneath the um, whale, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, Chad Van Galen uh, a few years earlier, or all the like Petra Glint in the um, in the spaceship, all that kind of stuff, right? Like it's 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 experiences that you could never have anywhere else when it comes to these shows uh, or programming like it. Uh, I'm just wondering if they're not that there are plans, but uh, do you think that there's a, an open mind to something like that in future at this uh, building as well? Definitely. We definitely, I think one of the, yeah, one of the things that, one of the values that child, the Children's Museum really brings to the community is being a community hub. Um, and so with the space, with more open space, more accessible space, with the, um, with the big event space in the back, there really are kind of endless opportunities for different community events like that. Um, and I think we all think they're really important because, I mean, if, if we've learned anything the last couple of years, community hubs, community interactions, the opportunities for like collaborative learning and collaborative ex experiences and like shared experiences with people you may not otherwise encounter, those kind of community spaces are really, really important. Um, so yeah, definitely events, events, events. We love it. <laughs> Amazing. Um, and we are a London's prequel podcast, so we are going to get into some London based questions. But before we do, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Uh, how can people find you? Sign up for programs, hours open, all that kind of stuff. You can find uh, nearly, hopefully, every question you have the answer, the answer on our website, londonchildrensmuseum.ca. You can find hours, admission, tickets, upcoming programs on our calendar, all that. You can also find us on Instagram at London Children's Museum. Um, and on our Facebook at London Children's Museum. You can also just call us, shoot us an email. We'll answer. Okay, well, it looks like we're going to get into our London based questions now. Now, these can be some of the toughest questions uh, in the entire episode. So uh, we're going to start off with maybe the toughest one favorite place to eat in the city. Oh my goodness, so many. We have a real delivery food problem at the Children's Museum. We are all ordering food constantly. I, um, I think I can speak for our general staff team, not me personally, but our general staff team. I think we order a lot of Ben Tan. Uh, <laughs> what else? What's it? Tonkyu, a lot of Tonkyu. Um, those are some of the go tos for us. Um, Shelby's. Love Shelby's. Yeah. Love Shelby's. Yeah. Yeah. Those would, you know, not to, it feels bad to pick and choose our favorite restaurants. There's so many great restaurants here, but uh, as a staff team, those three seem to be our go to. <laughs> and do you have your personal favorites, not just ones of the staff team? Choose. Oh I know. I'm going Ben Tan again. So <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going Ben Tan again. Mm hmm. I like the company bar. Nice. Ooh, cool. Very cool. Awesome. I need to get out to the company bar more. It's quite good. I can agree with that one. Uh, what would you say is your favorite neighborhood as we have been called the city of neighborhoods? Um, I personally, I live in Soho. So Soho has to be my answer. Um, you know, there's a lot changing. There's a lot changing quickly. Um, yeah, it's a uh, close to downtown. All the yeah, it's great. It's a great neighborhood. That's uh, I have to, I have to represent it. <laughs> yeah, same. I have to say Oak Ridge. That's where we live. That's where our kids go to school. Um, 
it just has so many great, I think all of the neighborhoods in London, I find have like these really cool parks. They all have access to like amazing outdoor space like the Sifton Bog. Um, I say Oak Ridge because those are the ones that we use the most, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I, like we really loved about London. Yeah. Yeah, really, the, I, we really are so lucky. Just access to the river, access to trails. It almost doesn't matter like which neighborhood you're in. Yeah, totally. Yeah. You have it all. No excuse, people. No excuse. <laughs> Is there a London small business you couldn't live without? Mm. My goodness. This is, Vanessa, you have to go first. You have to do it. <laughs> These are like hard hitting questions. <laughs> I mean, I just want to say all of Western fair, really. <laughs> I, all I can think of is like the restaurants. Like all those of are the restaurants. I can't live without them. That's They're, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, those are small businesses. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So many good ones, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. go to, uh, I still haven't tried the new um, version of uh prince al's diner yet have either of you been there yet? neptune no i haven't top of the list for sure i mm -hmm. wonder if they have their own wally burger uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll give them a review um if you were to have a perfect day in london so saying you have a day off from when you wake up to when you go to bed what would it entail hmm it's a good question i like a, a nice stroll in gibbons park um i like kind of following the the river side the the river part of that path kind of just north for as far as you can go uh yeah a nice stroll in gibbons park probably pick up some coffee maybe at sidetrack might uh take they're all going to be outdoor related it's like take the dog for a walk you know <laughs> mine would also be outdoor related they'd be winter themed i think we would do um bowler mountain Mm -hmm. skiing for the day and have lunch there because it's great sit outside by their fire um and then maybe like in the winter i don't know if this is allowed but we go over to the golf course and toboggan so <laughs> <laughs> that would be next up uh, no just uh we took <laughs> yes anyways <laughs> that sounds really fun I like that a lot. Uh, I need to toboggan more, but I feel like it's a little dangerous, isn't it? I mean, at a, at the at a certain course, age, there's nothing, <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing to run into where you're skiing. Yeah, that's on. true. Yeah. That's true. It's uh, totally free and clear. Mm -hmm. um, is there a hidden gem in the city? Now, that could be a person, place, or thing. Oh, a person, place, or thing. Oh. I. It's not so much hidden, but true taco at western fair has mm -hmm. my entire heart um it's hidden only in the sense that i can't eat it every day because you know they're not open every day but if i could i would um yeah true taco i think that has my entire heart and my entire stomach so it's <laughs> a good one um yeah i don't know if this is hidden either just maybe because it's far away from my house but um, what's the movie theater, Mira, that we go to where you could, like, it's got like couches, you lift up the arm. <laughs> I feel like we get discount tickets through the children's What, movie. Landmark? Yeah, Landmark. <laughs> okay. oh my it's so nice. And I feel like nobody ever goes there. It's like cozy little snug yeah. up on a love seat kind of deal. Yeah, Landmark is. Oh, it's just Landmark Cinemas. I can't remember. Um, Did you say where else? There's one yeah, in where, Kitchen. Where whereabouts? Sorry. It's down oh, the lake, down at it's on, yeah, it's on Wellington. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's I remember. Kind of now. Yeah. Away. I feel like it's not the hot cinema, but yeah, that was I'm pretty sure the first place that got the recliner seats because yeah. we would go there to get the recliner seats and then it they got them everywhere. Mm -hmm. I that think they were trendsetters. Perfect. They were yeah. trendsetters for sure. Yeah. It's always right. quiet. I really like it. It's a good movie theater. Hidden gem. You're right. It, it is. It's always like there's never people there, but it's not like mm -hmm. the rainbow though, where it's not like old movies either. It's still still kind of yeah. current. I like that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, great. All right. We've gotten into the final portion of the show. Aaron, would you like to introduce 
Our yes, final it is time for our quick decision making game. So it's uh, called this or that. that. So in this game, we're going to give you two options that are kind of similar of things in the city and just right off the top of your head, you let us know which one you would prefer. So couldn't be a little bit difficult, but just kind of go with whatever comes to your head first. Are we ready? Got it. All right. Starting off with a maybe hard one, maybe an easy one. Western Fair Market or Covent Garden Market? Covent Garden. Got to be Western Fair. Oh, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> but true taco. We already talked about true taco. <laughs> There's good points for both. Um, if you're if you're vinyl heads or music listeners, Groove Records or Odyssey Records. Oh, it feels so mean to pick, but I I would go I would go to Groove. I think it's closer to my house. You know, I I've been going there longer, but both great. Mm -hmm. Um, same. <laughs> Uh, Masonville Mall or White Oaks Mall? Masonville, but just because of its proximity to the Indigo, I like that <laughs> to go there. Mm -hmm. um, I think White Oaks. Yeah, going White Oaks. That, that must be nostalgia, right? Yeah, I think so. And I, I feel like when I was, yeah, yeah, you read that on my face. Like that was good. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like when I was younger, I just get, just got lost. It just felt like absolutely massive and that, you know, hexagon pattern, whatever the layout is, just, you know, you get lost in that. Yeah, it, it is hard to figure out where you are in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Springbank Park or Gibbons Park? Gibbons. Um, there's too many geese in spring bank you guys let's be honest there's too many geese there mm -hmm. and the pool option is nice when it's very hot it's true Absolutely. uh fanshawe college or western university as a western grad i think i maybe have to say western uh, yeah sam <laughs> <laughs> what about uh london brewing co-op or anderson's craft ales oh love them both love them both uh -huh. But I maybe I'm maybe gonna say the brewing co-op. <laughs> I was gonna say Anderson's. Ah. The dividing line. <laughs> um, for the book readers, the Brown and Dixon or City Lights. City Lights, also for nostalgia reasons. <laughs> Don't know. It's probably no surprise that um, as somebody who works at a museum, I'm like picking a lot of these based on their sort of nostalgic qual quality <laughs> to me. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some fantastic uh, bookstores, local bookstores here in the city. Uh, I, know. I already outed myself with the Indigo thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the uh, next one here is bike the Thames Valley Parkway or hike in an environmentally significant area. Hike. Hike for sure. Have the we we have some pets, the dogs, they need to come with us. They're mm -hmm. a danger to us on bikes. Must be <laughs> must be a hike. Mm -hmm. Uh fire roasted coffee or Asmara coffee? Fire roasted. Well that was I haven't, if we're being honest, I haven't been to Asmara, so I should I guess I should check that out before I really make a decision. <laughs> that was a fair, honest answer yes. there. I <laughs> Last one for all the moviegoers, uh, Highland Theater or Mustang Drive-In? Highland. Oh, another separator. Okay, there you go. That's how, do we have anything in common besides working here? I don't know. <laughs> do you even know each other? This is <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time. That That's pretty much... That's the episode, guys. You made yeah. it through the lightning yeah. round, yeah. you know, uh, incredible job. No scars, no bruises yeah. on the way through. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today. We really do appreciate it. And I'm sure the listeners are going to get a lot of education out of this episode, which I'm excited about. Um, for this, uh, if you let the uh, listeners know again, I believe you said 18 months is what we're looking for, for the opening of the new building. Uh, anything else you want to leave our listeners with before we head out? Um, just that I hope you take some time to play, you know, play matters. It's important. It's good for our mental health, our physical health. If not here, then someone else, somewhere else, just play, you know? Yeah. And we're still open. We oh, that to too. Yeah. <laughs> Come and play anytime. There's lots of fun stuff happening. So. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm Mira. And I'm Vanessa. And we're from the London Children's Museum. And you're listening to London's Pretty Cool Podcast.